So if you could describe for me the, the various types of information that you feel are important at the quantum level. Uh, and you mentioned in your book things like um, social information, economic information, therm thermodynamic information, biological information. Yes. Can you describe some of these things and, and why, they're, why they're important for us to understand the origins of the universe? At first sight, all of these different types of information, they really look very different to one another. So you've got the concept of disorder in thermodynamics, how chaotic a system is actually. And then you contrast that to the information in our genome, which determines what kind of uh, being we get in biology. And at first sight, you would say, what, what on earth is the relationship uh, between these two different types of informations. One, one, one looks much more orderly in living systems, uh, whereas in thermodynamics you are exactly talking about the opposite end of that spectrum, disorder. But actually what I try to show in my book is that it's one and the same concept of information that underlines both of these. And in fact then I go on and present various other types of information like e in economics and I think I talk a lot about the theory of betting, you know, how to place your bets in a way so as to maximize uh, the, the future profit. And I think that kind of information, again surprisingly, is exactly the same type of information we encounter in thermodynamics and in biology and that's really fascinating. How are they the same though? Because, and, and ultimately, how are they important at this quantum level? Because when you talk about information theory, yes. what you're talking about is you're talking about the origins and the fabric of the universe. That's it. How is placing a bet and yes. your cell biology, how are they the same that's, and that's actually it? That's really an interesting question and I think this is one of the things that made a, a really deep uh, impact on me. When you, when you see that all of these things are somehow connected in this very simple way. And, and one way of describing the connection is to say that actually you need very little to, to define the concept of information in the first place. You may think, you know, this is a very complicated phenomenon and I need all sorts of, all sorts of things actually to, to define in the first place in order to be able to talk about information. So may, you may say maybe I need to talk about the language that the person is using before I can talk about the information that that language conveys. And the amazing thing is that a person who, who realized the simplicity of the concept for the first time was actually an American engineer, Claude Shannon, who is uh, one of the main characters in the, in the book actually. He already appears at the very beginning in, in chapter 3. And he said when you strip it out of all the unnecessary uh, baggage, what you arrive at at the core of it is just the concept of probability. All you need is certain randomness there, some uncertainty as to the outcome of what you're trying to describe. Um, and basically once you have a probability for something to happen, then you can immediately, and actually that's the only thing, that's what's amazing about it, that's the only concept you need to have in order to define information. And that's one and the same information we are talking about, you know, in physics, in thermodynamics, as well as in economics and biology. That's what's amazing. Some physicists, some quantum yes. physicists, uh, particle physicists, yes. would define the fabric of the universe as being made of, you know, nanoparticles, would yes. be made up of strings or, or whatever yes. the, the theories yes. are. You're suggesting yes. that that information is, is, yes. is superior? Let me try to give you actually an, an argument for why this is so. I think um, it really depends on what your ultimate aim is to explain. And usually what we do in, in science is to start with a certain basic set of laws like the ones you were describing in, in particle physics, which is all based on basically quantum mechanics and relativity ultimately. And we start from, from these laws and then we try to derive everything else. So we try to derive subatomic behavior, atomic behavior, then larger objects and maybe ultimately the whole universe. But actually there's always an open question at the end of the whole thing which you can raise and the, the simple question is where do the laws themselves come from? So it seems that, and this is actually how uh, frequently we are criticized in science, that we are never going to be able to go beyond these laws and explain where do they come from in the first place. And this is actually a challenge that I wanted to, uh, to tackle in this book. Um, obviously, you know, 
you can only be speculative at, at, at this stage. And I think none of us really have the ultimate answer where does all this stuff around us come from. But I think information is a far better concept than any other because whatever else you suggest in physics you can always say but where does that come from how come we have these particles how come we have these forces whereas i think information can almost bootstrap itself out of this inf you know, it's, it's something that philosophers call an infinite regression you know you you give me an explanation but i can always say but where does that come from and we can always you know we can we, we, we never seem to be able to end this list of questions, but I think information is a concept actually that's the only one I know of, which is kind of capable almost of explaining itself. It's capable of closing this circle, and I think that's, that's actually the main message that, that I try to convey at the end of the book. It sounds in many ways that um, the concept of information that you're describing as the catch-all for, well, what creates these laws? Yes. Other people would conflate with faith, or they would, create, they would conflate with a higher order, a being that says, well, and thus became these yes. laws. Yes. How, how are you not conflating this concept of, of the spontaneous generation of information at the beginning of the universe with a faith, a, a god? Or a yes, deity. you are right that that in in physics um, we frequently um, um, encounter this uh, this question of the ultimate origin, and it sounds as though it's the same question that people in various religions have also raised. And and I think the the common answer you encounter then, I think I talk a little bit about about these aspects in my book as well, is that th there was some kind of original. Uh, creator of all this information. I think again the trouble the trouble for us in physics is that this really doesn't solve anything in the sense that as a physicist then you would also like to be able to understand that being itself and you would maybe like to explain the origin of, of, of God uh, itself and then you encounter the same infinite regression you know so who created the original God and so on and I think that's why um, it seems as though you're postulating something far more complex than what you're trying to explain, which is the universe. So to a scientist, this is never an explanation. You know, why is the universe like this? Because there was something even more complicated that created it the way it is. And I think to us, this doesn't sound like a good answer, actually. We want something better than that. You can argue that we will never get there in science to this ultimate, you know, it's, it, it, could, be, it could well be an open-ended enterprise. Um, but I think the element of faith, maybe that you mentioned, that so, of course, we also have a set of beliefs in science. I mean, we are human beings after all. We believe in the following method of understanding. So there is only one method, as far as we are concerned, that leads you to the to the ultimate um, uh, secure truth of some of some form, and that's the scientific method. And the method is: let's make a conjecture. And then let's try to refute it as far as we can. And those conjectures that, that survive for longest are basically what we call currently the laws of nature. And we are not dogmatic about it at all. We, you know, if, if you have compelling evidence tomorrow that quantum mechanics is wrong, then I would be very happy and I think all of my colleagues would be very happy to change our minds and to upgrade ourselves to the, to the new theory. Um, of course, you can always challenge us and say, but why do you believe that this is how, this is the only way to understand the world? And the only answer I can give is that it makes sense to me, you know, it really works for me. If we take this notion of information yes. as the fabric, as the, as the, uh, the origin of yes. and the creation of and, and what exists around us, yes. um, do you, I, I, as somebody who imbues information Yes. with emotion, yes. with socially generated constructs. Yes. I find it very hard to face and accept how you describe this, and, and Shannon describes this idea of the binary aspect yes. of information. So it's either a one or a zero, yes. it's a yes or a no. When I think of information as, as socially constructed, how, do you, how can you explain then the emergence of things like free will, of faith, of aesthetic, of these, of these socially constructed I, concepts? I think it's a very deep, deep question, actually. I think you should remember you're talking to a simpleton, right? I'm, <laughs> I'm a physicist, so I think I... They, I Man, if you're I, a simpleton. <laughs> I, I, think, I think I can 
you know, I, I probably did as, as best as I could in, in my uh, uh, chapter on social informatics. But even then, I really picked out a few phenomena that are, I think, simple enough for us to be able to describe in terms of information. But I think the other things that you mentioned, they seem to me far too complicated now uh, to be able to easily derive within physics. Again, you know, here my faith as a, as a physicist comes in, and I do believe that one day we'll probably be able to explain phenomena as complicated as love, for example. Uh, but at the moment, I don't think anyone has any ideas uh, how to approach that. I think, you know, going back to your notion of a simple binary digit, a zero or one, being able to explain everything, quantum mechanics does bring all sorts of shades of gray between these two black and white uh, numbers, if you like. And I think that's, that's one of the things that I, that I argue in my book is, is fundamental ultimately to the concept of information. It's really interesting that Shannon himself, he never learned about quantum mechanics and he was able to still talk meaningfully about information without, without quantum mechanics, which is very interesting because I think it's impossible to do it actually properly. And it comes from the fact that in everyday classical physics, you know, governed by Newtonian laws, Ultimately, the world is actually deterministic. There is no randomness whatsoever. And I said that the key concept for information is that of probability. There's got to be something that surprises you when it happens. If you could really compute everything and predict everything, as we know we could if the world was, was really classical, then I think there would be no, no concept of surprise. There would be no information because everything would just be clear to you from the beginning to the end of the universe. So somehow we need a genuine randomness that cannot be explained by anything more fundamental. It's not caused by anything actually and I think that's the key concept and that's how you can try to explain everything out of nothing in a, in a sense. So I think even information itself only makes sense within quantum mechanics. So it's the, it's the absence of knowing. It's almost the, the lack of, of knowing. Of knowing. That it. means that you can continue to ask these questions. That's it. But at the same time, though, you posit in the book that the universe is information, yes. that, that, we, that we are information. Yes. How is humanity information? Can you break that down for me? So, you know, if I'm, if I'm information, can I be replicated? What does that mean for immortality? I mean, these that are big is questions. That's a fantastic question. But Actually, are we, we, how, how are we sitting here information? I think, again, this is not, uh, this is not fully understood in the sense that um, uh, when you talk about molecular biology, for example, then we encounter all sorts of break, breakthroughs these days on a weekly basis, and they are mainly related to the question of, of um, how much does the, the genetic material actually determine um, the, the phenotype, as we call it, the outcome, you know, the, the, the features of the, the macroscopic features of, uh, of, of beings. And I think this is not fully understood. Again, you would have people who would say it's all in the genome and the social aspect is not that relevant, actually. All your features are fully fixed. My eyebrows have just that's gone right. up. No, no, <laughs> that's social right. aspects think, aren't relevant. I think you can easily challenge that, I agree. So you, you, you can almost go into the other extreme and say, well, you know, the genetic material is fine and determines something, but the key thing is actually the social aspect of it. So I think at the moment we are so uncertain that you can meaningfully um, support either of these two uh, extremes. But I think what's interesting is that if you look at the way in which meaningful information arises, so something, something of real importance, then, then it's the same method um, used by, by biological information that's also used uh, by social information. And this is amazing. And it again mirrors this method of conjectures and refutations. So basically you come up with a spontaneous information and then the subset that's not good for you, whatever defines good now, of course, within a social context, good is a different, you know, it's a different definition to a biological or maybe a physical context. That gets eliminated. And then whatever survives, some ca keeps coming up with new information. So we have these conjectures and refutations basically 
played out at various levels. And I think the social level is one level, but then the biological level is another level. And in this sense, they are one and the same. That if you look at the underlying dynamics, if you say, how would I mathematically describe the whole thing, surprisingly you get to the same piece of mathematics, actually. And that's amazing, I think. The, being able to deconstruct humanity, uh, and whether it's the social or the, the physical or the biological, I find very difficult. I think it's a very... But simply to, to come down to this idea of mathematical yes. quant quantification. Yes. Because then that does have real implications for it, whether it we, we are, are we immortal? You know, are we, are we able to be recreated through, you know, just having the right recipe yes. and, and the right ingredients? I talk frequently about um, uh, quantum teleportation. That's one of the protocols, for example, we know uh, how to execute when it comes to very simple systems. So, for example, we can take a particle of light, a photon, and we can basically recreate this photon um, in a different laboratory that's maybe uh, 100 meters away or even 100 kilometers away. And we can do the same thing with a single atom uh, and, and, and various smaller objects. And then you can extrapolate and you can say, well, okay, you know, human beings are nothing but a bunch of atoms, actually. Admittedly, there is a lot of atoms in us, but it's nothing else as far as physics is concerned. And you can say, what if you apply the same teleportation scheme and you got another copy of yourself somewhere else? What does that actually mean? Would that really be yourself? Or would it be another person maybe with the same physical features but who wouldn't feel the same? And I think, obviously, this is, again, uh, I'm going back to this notion that I'm, a, that I'm a simpleton, I'm a physicist. I would say as far as we know currently, the answer would be yes. This would have to be uh, yourself there. But, but of course, this is open to, to all sorts of attacks and I think ultimately we can only wait until the experiment is done to test this. So I would say there is nothing that suggests to us currently that there is anything beyond that that we need to look for, but we could easily be proven, uh, proven wrong. Do you feel that now that we're in this, this concept of the information age where you know, there's so much content, so much information yes. that's being generated, yes. we're, trying to, we're trying to synthesize and yes. conceptualize it at yes. the moment. Do you feel that we're in an era of rapid advance, that at the moment we're moving so quickly that you know, we're never going to move this quickly again or we, we haven't moved so quickly in the future? Are we, are we, in a very hubris kind of way, at an, at an important phase in our evolution in terms of how we understand information? There are these two uh, directions in which knowledge goes. And I think one direction is simply to keep doing more and more experiments and keep getting more and more data out of your experiments. But then, of course, the op so in a way, that generates more and more information. But then against that goes our scientific method of conjectures and refutation, which, which basically tries to synthesize the whole thing and tries to go in the backwards direction and, and says, can I actually generate and explain all this information with only a few very simple sets of uh, rules and laws, just like I tried to do in my book with the, with the concept of, uh, of information. And I think it's a completely open question whether the game of catching up that we are trying to do and as we synthesize all of these things, you know, will we ever be able to do that ultimately? I think this is completely unknown. It may well be that there is a vast domain uh, of, of, of the universe which will never be uh, understood by this matter. I wouldn't like to, to think like that. As a scientist, obviously, I believe that, uh, that ultimately we'll be able to syn synthesize the whole thing. And I think, and I think, it looks like there is, I mean, again, you can only extrapolate from the, from the past 400 years of, of science, and it is a very young uh, activity as such. Uh, so it is a huge leap of faith to say we'll continue to play this game as well as we have so far. I mean, a good analogy, I think, is if you put yourself in the perspective of people in the early 1920s who just discovered the laws of quantum physics, and then they said, look, it's extremely difficult to apply this even to the simplest of all atoms, the hydrogen atom. Already that requires a huge effort to understand. And then along 
comes someone else who says, look, I've got a piece of solid. We're talking about 10 to the power of 24. So 10 followed by 24 zeros of atoms. And you are telling me you find it hard to understand even a single atom. How on earth are you going to understand a whole solid? And actually this happened very shortly afterwards. It's called the solid state physics. It's actually the basis of all the modern technology. So somehow being negative by saying, oh, it looks as though it's too complicated, this has always been refuted by scientists in the past. And that's why I believe, I, I believe that we will be able to continue with this kind of attitude in the future. So I think there is hope uh, for us to understand more and more.